In today's episode, we're going to be talking about integrated pest management, talking about the history behind it, what it is, and how you can implement it in your own garden, whether you're working with a small pot on your kitchen table or you're dealing with large scale agriculture. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to the Yule Acres podcast where we are rooted in nature using examples from nature with the aid of modern technology to better help grow your garden. I'm your host Bryson Yule. In today's episode we are going to be talking about integrated pest management. First off what is integrated pest management? The actual definition of integrated pest management is the management of agricultural and horticultural pests that minimize the use of chemicals and emphasize the natural low toxicity methods such as the use of crop rotation, beneficial predatory insects. It is really important that we try and move back to an integrated pest management system. Now what is an integrated pest management system? Integrated pest management means you take examples from nature and try and implement them into your gardening experience so that way you can grow in coordination with nature rather than against it. The motto of Yule Acres is rooted in nature. Our whole mindset, our whole philosophy is surrounded by the idea of integrated pest management. We have cultural practices that have developed over thousands of years to help us grow as environmentally sustainably as possible. Meanwhile, using advantages of the modern age technology that have developed over time and marrying those two methods together to give us the best total outcome. Why is it that we want to have integrated pest management systems? In the past, we've had great societies develop over a long period of time. Whether you're looking at Mesoamerica with the Aztecs Indians, you're looking at the Chinese Indian, the Egyptians, the Fertile Crescent, historically speaking, you have these great centers of civilization that have developed, moving from tribal nomadic development societies into a sedentary based society, moving from hunter gatherers to the development of agriculture. As these populations grew, there's a concentration of not only people, but also plants and animals. With that greater concentration, it developed a greater concentration of diseases that infect plants, that infect animals. That concentration made when there was a disease breakout all the much more devastating because you have these development of these horrible diseases, insect famines in a much smaller isolated area. In past history, when you have a disease outbreak, it's going to infect a small population. But because it's isolated in groups, the damage is going to be limited to small areas because there's not that ability to exponentially grow in a concentration of a smaller area. That's why integrated pest management is so important. As we've be grown as a society, human populations have grown much larger. Our centers of growth of agriculture that we grow our food that we live off of have become much more concentrated as well. When you have an outbreak of a disease, it's going to be much more compact as you have the globalization. It's going to affect a much larger area. For example, in the early 1800s, you have something called the Great Potato Famine. Under normal circumstances, you would have a potato disease that infects a small village, a small location that is going to affect that one group or village. It's going to be sad for that little group. But with the integration of Irish society, their entire society developed off of potatoes. Their whole mainstay, their whole production became very important off of potatoes. Once in the past, their society would have grown off of barley, wheat, other 
fish that had grown off it with it being an island nation. When potatoes were imported from the New World to Ireland, they found that potatoes were a potatoes grew absolutely perfect in the Irish climate. And so they decided to import more and more amount of potatoes. However, there was a downside to that. Potatoes were not native to Ireland. Because of that, there were many diseases that the potatoes in the New World had grown resistant to, accustomed to. When it encountered new diseases in the new land of Ireland, these potatoes were susceptible to the diseases. Because you had the entire Irish society, their entire caloric intake was primarily dependent on the potato. When the potato crashed, the Irish society crashed with it. When you have condensing of one caloric intake focused on one source, the effect of that famine is going to be so significantly greater. Whenever you look at the demise of a great civilization, whether it be the Aztec Empire, whether you talk about Egypt, whether you can give an example of the British Empire, whether you're talking about a Chinese, Indian. In the footnotes of history, it typically is not the main cause, but it is generally a number two, number three factor that you can attribute to this civilization collapsed because there was a great famine. Their food caloric intake that supported the society that made them healthy to able to combat that famine got destroyed, cleared out. So by looking at the three main pillars of integrated pest management, whether it's prevention, monitoring, or intervention, that is going to help improve our sources to maintain a good strong food base for our caloric intake not only as an individual level, but also on a community level. First, we're gonna be talking about prevention. Prevention is by far the most important way to help us encourage us to development in dealing with pest diseases. By having a strong base and developing that first, that is going to allow you to be able to cause and solve the vast majority of the other problems. Let's use tomatoes as a really great example. So tomatoes are very nutrient intensive. They need a large amount of nitrogen. They need a large amount of carbon sources. Oftentimes when I see people go down the grocery store, they'll go down to the local nursery, they'll buy some tomatoes and then they'll buy a pot and then they'll buy some soil and they'll call it good. What I would argue instead is first set up your soil the soil itself is going to be the nutrient bank that everything else is based off of. A lot of times people ignore soil when that is by far the most important thing that we look at. That's where a lot of the bugs that cause the famine home. That's where a lot of the diseases live that cause that. The vast majority of the time when there is an issue with a famine, it can be attributed to the soil whether the disease is soil in present, whether the bug lays their eggs and gets started in the soil. All of it can be started in soil. First develop a good soil nutrient bank, then that's gonna do most of the legwork. So what can you do to develop a strong bank account when developing and working with soil? It entirely depends on the scale of growing that you're trying to do. Whether you're looking at an eight inch pot, a raised garden bed, or a large garden plot, or commercial agricultural growing, all the methods can be very similar. If you're dealing with a small little eight inch pot, by far the easiest thing that you can do is go ahead and get yourself a nice high quality rich bag of soil. Now I said just a minute ago, these guys go out, they buy a bag of soil, they call it good. Well, a lot of times there is development that you could do to help encourage the soil to grow. When you're dealing with a bag of soil, oftentimes that soil, it starts out, it has a lot of microorganisms, and it's nice and healthy, and it grows really strong. Then they take it in a bag, seal it in this little plastic bag, and confine it for months on end that sits in storage, until it goes to the nursery, until it goes to the big box store available for someone to buy it. Mm -hmm. This soil 
is going to be inside this little plastic sarcophagus for months on end. What biodiversity used to be in the soil of being a high quality soil has slowly eroded, slowly died off over time. Here's what I would encourage you to do. Get your bag of soil, get a nice little pot, fill it up. Add some water, make sure it has nice, good moisture involved in it. When you go to buy your bag of soil, go ahead and buy yourself a small bag of worm castings as well. Those worm castings, if they haven't been sitting there for a long period of time, are a really, really great source of micronutrients. They're going to be a really great source of micro beneficial bacteria that you could add to the soil. Take some of that manure, add it into the soil itself, and that will help to kickstart the soil. Let it sit for a couple weeks. Let those microorganisms have a chance to grow and expand throughout the entire pot. So that way, even though your pot may be small, think of it as a very small ecosystem. Allow the small beneficial bacteria to start to grow. Mycorrhizae are, is a really, really great example of something that you can add. They have it in both freeze-dried form and liquid form that you could add it to the soil. Take some of these soil pellets, add it to your soil. Take the liquid form of mycorrhizae bacteria and add it to the soil. Give the soil several weeks for it to grow. By having a mix of some great beneficial worm castings, a little bit of that good dark rich soil that's carbon rich, having a little bit of compost in it, having a little bit of mulch, and adding that mycorrhizae, leaving it a time to rest, giving it several weeks for it to grow, you're going to encourage a much healthier microclimate inside that small little plastic bucket that you have sitting on top of your shelf. Now, even though there are no plants inside this small little bucket, you're going to want to water it on a regular basis. Those mycorrhizae need water in order to live. There, it will help it to further develop. By taking this step a month ahead of time, you're going to help give a good, strong, firm foundation so that way when you're ready to plant your plant, whether it's an herb, your tomato, it will really help not only in the microorganisms of the soil, but you're also going to have a good, strong base for the nutrients as well. If you need to add a little bit of artificial synthetic fertilizers, it's going to give the microbes a good strong base that are already there to very easily break down those micro fertilizers. Oftentimes, when you add a synthetic fertilizer to the ground, in most cases, the soil itself, is if it has not been properly developed, those nutrients, when it gets water, are gonna be flushed straight through to the soil in the water runoff. The plants will not get nowhere near the benefit that it will if you have a good, strong mycorrhizae bacteria base to develop it. A lot of those nutrients, a lot of those fertilizers need a little bit of time to be processed, to be broken down. By having that strong mycorrhizae base system set up, that will allow the fertilizers to be more easily broken down, allowing it to be more readily available for the plant, saving you more bang for your buck and your dollar because more of it's getting taken up by the plant rather than getting flushed through the soil to beyond the root zone of the plant or being flushed out in the bottom of the pot container that you use to collect the water runoff. Now the exact same sample can be used when you're dealing with larger whether you're dealing with a raised garden bed, you can do the exact same thing just on a much larger scale. Add a little bit more at compost, add a little bit more worm castings, add more material to accommodate the much larger size. But keep in mind, the larger the size that you have, the longer the amount of time that it's going to take to develop. The rawer the material that you're using, the more take time it's going to take for that mulch to break down. So when you're developing an above ground raised garden bed, if you're working with ground directly in the soil, what I personally would recommend is do all your soil prep work the year prior that you want to plant. So let's say you want to plant tomatoes in the springtime. The previous fall is when to, 
when you want to add your mulch, your leaf litter, your worm castings, add all of your mycorrhizae, add that material the year prior so it gives it a chance to develop, to grow, to break down. So when you plant those plants, it's going to be much further along, allowing you the necessity to not have to use as many synthetic fertilizers in order for that to grow. When you have a good, strong nutrient base, a good, strong fertilizer that is healthy soil, that's going to do most of the issues. One of the major reasons why plants have issues, why they are more susceptible to diseases, is because they don't have a good, balanced nutrition. Us as humans, we tend to get a little bit sicker when we're not eating a balanced diet, when we're not getting a full night's sleep. The exact same thing happens with plants. By allowing it to have a good, balanced diet, that's going to allow the plant to be much healthier. The next item that you can take a look at in your prevention is helping out with what's called crop rotation. In using examples of the tomato, the tomato is a very nitrogen thirsty plant. It's going to take a tremendous amount of nitrogen and depleting the soil faster than it can be regenerated by the microbes, by the nitrogen cycle, all those factors that help to slowly add those nutrients into the ground. One thing that was developed to help out is we learned that if I plant something else rather than a tomato in that same spot, that will allow it to recover some of its nutrients. How does that translate into modern error? Let's say that you have a plant that uses a large amount of nitrogen like the tomato. Rather than planting tomatoes in the same spot year after year after year, plant something different. If you enjoy peas, if you enjoy beans, plant legumes. Beans, peas are part of the legume family. These plants have a process what is called nitrogen fixation. They actually have a special developed process that they developed over years and years of evolution of taking nitrogen from the air, converting it into a system that would work better and sticking it in the ground. They've developed a symbiotic relationship by microorganisms in the soil to develop nitrogen into the ground. That nitrogen fixation process allows to add nitrogen to the soil, adding more of it than it actually uses. So it uses different nutrients at different rates. By not having a tomato, by putting a bean, or even if you want something else, let's say you like carrots, beets, leafy greens. By using a different plant that uses nutrients in different forms at different ratios, that will allow the ground itself to recover a little bit more. During the high plains, we found that corn grew really, really well, that wheat grew really, really well in the high plains of the United States. So that was one of the most profitable products. Year over year, we grew corn, 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 corn. In the South, they did the exact same thing with tobacco, 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 tobacco. Year after year, same crops, same location. For five years, it was very, very profitable. After that five, 10 years though, a lot of that nutrient base bank that was in the soil got used up by the plants. And so it was no longer available. They started having to use synthetic fertilizers because the native nutrients in the soil was no longer there. They started having massive die off, which then made it so they were no longer profitable. Unfortunately, that's the way of things. If you don't properly take care of your bank account, if you wanna be on a, th a spend free, lack of environment, always swiping your credit card, eventually you're gonna hit that limit on your credit card and you're gonna have to file bankruptcy and get everything wiped out. You're gonna have to start from scratch and have everything completely depleted. That is the exact same scenario with your bank account in your soil. If you wanna be constantly withdrawing, constantly swiping your credit card on your soil bank and not actually adding to it, then you are going to have significant problems. That's the first step. Second step 
is when you have depleted soil, when you have issues, you're going to have diseases that like to live in that same environment. When you have a plant that struggles, then diseases are going to be much easier to take it out. One major disease that tomatoes can deal with is one that's called tomato spotted wilt virus. Tomato spotted wilt virus is spread through an insect called thrips. Thrips are going to attack a tomato, stab it, suck the juices out of it, and then they are going to encourage it to gain that disease. Thrips lay their eggs in the tomato. They also sometimes lay their eggs in the ground. If you lay, if you have your tomato in that same area year after year, you're going to have the tomato spotted wilt virus remain in that soil. And that's going to encourage that disease to get bigger, stronger, more devastating, spreading from tomato to tomato. However, if you choose to lay a carrot or a bean in that same area that your tomato would have been in, that's going to break the disease cycle. That's going to break the insect cycle so the same insects may not necessarily be able to have the same food source. By breaking the food source of the tomato plant, the disease, the thrips, are not going to be able to continue on and it's not going to allow for that to continue on. It's going to give you a hard break. That's why crop rotation became so significantly strong when it comes to cultural practices in the prevention sector of it. Not only does it help with your nutrient bank of the soil, but it also helps with the disease issues so that way you're not going to be on the perpetual loop of always shooting yourself in the foot in hopes of getting that dollar. Short term, you're going to have great financial benefit, great food benefit from the crop itself by planting that same crop year over year. But by the time you get to year three, by the time you get to year four, your benefit is going to be completely wiped out and you're going to have nothing. By alternating it and having it a much more level, your sigmoidal curve is going to be less of an issue. You're going to have less good years, but you're also going to have less bad years as well. And so you're going to be much more successful having a good a little bit throughout the years. It's kind of like long-term investing with your 401k. It's not as sexy as a financial portfolio to develop, but long-term, it's going to be much more beneficial to the larger group of people that actually work at it. That is dealing with the prevention pillar of integrated pest management systems. Now we're going to be going and looking at the second pillar of integrated pest management systems. The second pillar of integrated pest management systems is monitoring. Now monitoring has two sides of the same coin that you're looking at. One is knowledge, one is effort. If you try and look at monitoring systems, you first have to know what you're looking for. Have a knowledge base that allows you to look for those items. Going back to integrated pest management in dealing with tomatoes. I mentioned the nutrient-based systems as well as the thrip, as well as the disease tomato spotted wilt virus. Many people can look at a tomato. They may not know what tomato spotted wilt virus looks like, but what they do know is the tomato looks really bruised. It looks really sad. It's completely flopped over and it looks really, really sad. Anyone can identify that my tomato plant is looking very sad and it's not healthy. Once you get to that point, there's nothing you can do about it. The only thing you can do, burn the plant, rip it out, and hope to start again, not causing that issue to continue on. There are indications, there are signs that you can take a look at with the tomato spotted root virus to help you out. If you know what you're looking for, the tomato will tell you what it needs. First and foremost, we'll be looking at nutrients. Universally, when you're looking at nutrients, there are common signs when you're looking at nutrient deficiencies in soil. Nitrogen is a really great example. When you have nitrogen deficiency in soils, you're going to have the leaves turn a bright yellow color. 
and it's typically going to start at the very tip of the leaf and move its way down. By knowing what you're looking at in nutrient deficiencies, that's going to allow you to add nitrogen to the soil, to add things to the soil to help improve it. Now, ideally, year over year, you're going to add compost. You're going to add some manure. You're going to add these factors that will help to increase the long-term bank account of your soil for these nutrients. But in most cases, we're going to have plants in the ground that are going to be using up the nutrients faster than we're able to add them. Or, more likely the case, is it's going to take time for that nutrient bank to build until we have sufficient that we no longer have to use synthetic fertilizers. If we need to use an organic fertilizer, if we need to use synthetic fertilizers for short-term purposes to make sure the health of our plant, go for it. It is vitally important that we do those, but make certain what you're looking for so that way you're not adding too much of a fertilizer. Here's a key example for you. We are looking at tomato plant and it's showing signs of nitrogen deficient. So what do you do? You add a really great fertilizer that has really high in phosphorus, that has really high in potassium. Well, you have so much phosphorus, you have so much potassium in the soil that the soil can't handle it. When you water it, it gets flushed out. It gets flushed out to the pond, it gets flushed out to the lake, then it gets flushed out to the ocean. There's so much phosphorus, phosphate salts in those lakes, in those rivers, in those oceans, that you get an algae bloom. The algae bloom then takes out all the oxygen in the local area, which then kills all the fish. Compounding for large areas can have large consequences. When all you needed was a fertilizer that allows you to give nitrogen, but you added a bunch of other stuff to it that didn't cause it, which then can have a cascading effect to cause other environmental cascading issues. By only applying what you need, that will allow to help save nature from man-caused issues on the larger scale. Your own individual garden, not a big deal. Your own neighborhood, probably not a big deal. When you start talking about city-wide issues, state-wide issues, province-wide issues, country-wide issues, developing into a region, that's where you start to have major issues. One really great example of this is going to be the Mississippi Delta. I used to live in Louisiana. Absolutely love the Mississippi River. By far one of the most productive regions in North America, if not the world, is the Mississippi Delta. You have the, Missi- you have the Missouri River, you have the Mississippi River, as well as many of its subsidiaries all feed into this very major heavy silt rich environment that goes through the Ohio Valley, the Tennessee Valley, down into the Arkansas Valley, eastern Texas, Louisiana. Some of the most productive cropland in North America all gets fed by this major river system. Large amounts of fertilizer are used throughout the entire Illinois, Ohio River Valley that all congruates into the river system that then gets pushed down into the Mississippi. Higher up the river, not a big deal, but it all collects into the Mississippi River that then gets pushed out into the Mississippi Delta. One of the most productive fishing areas in the U.S., there is now a major dead zone around the Mississippi Delta because there's large amounts of fertilizers, large amounts of phosphate salts that get pushed in that area that cause major algae brooms that have caused a dead zone of fish that are nowhere near as productive as they once were. If these systems are not managed, you can have the exact same issues caused throughout the entire world. So by looking at the plants and then monitoring stage, by gaining that education, reading books, watching YouTube videos of quality good sources and learning that material, you'll be able to then deal with the aftermath and not have to deal with that in the intervention stage. So that works really great on a nutrient-based level. Now, how do you deal with monitoring? For example, of the tomato, thrips are going to have a very small 
thin beak. And they're going to have what's called a puncture method, where they will take their mouth and stab the leaf of the... And they will suck. And it will cause a small leaf light indenture kind of as if you have a mosquito bite that will come and stab you it'll have a small little bump you'll be able to see small little bumps on the tomato plant you'll be able to see small little ringlets suction marks off of the tomato plant one thrip two thrip one aphid two aphid not a big deal but these guys don't comes in onesies twosies they comes in hundreds in thousands it's going to be death by a thousand cuts. By monitoring the insect itself, by learning what you're looking at, that will help to prevent it. What are some tools that can really help you in this monitoring aside from education? Get yourself a small little magnifying glass so that way you can more easily observe the underside of the leaf. Go ahead and get small sticky traps. There is a great new invention that has recently come on the market that is called yellow sticky traps. What they do is they take the natural pheromone of the insect and they stick it on this piece of paper. Item that's very sticky. So this buggy boy comes along, gets stuck to the sticky paper, and then it's going to not be able to continue on. But what makes it easier is you're able to look at this little piece of paper and say, oh, wow, look. I have this particular insect in this paper. Therefore, I know I have this particular insect in my garden. So that way I know that I can begin to prevent them from being there. Not only that, but if you've, it also helps with the percentage of your issue that you've got. So on the vast majority of these little yellow sticky papers, it has a grid cross section done to it. There's some math that you can do that's going to say if you have so many insects per square inch you want to take this step if you have this many in insects per square inch you then want to move on to this step it helps to diagnose saying i have this big of a problem therefore i need to take this measure by having some of those yellow sticky traps that helps to have a really key measure you're not always going to find an insect sucking on the insect the leaf you're not always going to be able to find eggs you may not be able to find damage on the plant itself but you will be able to see the poor little buggy boy stuck to the paper or look at it and go, yep, that's him. And you're easily going to be able to find. So some of these items that have come out in modern technology that are commonly been used inside the greenhouse sector for decades are now much more readily available to the home gardener. Get yourself some sticky paper, hang it from a tree, put it on a small little stick, place it in the garden and that will allow you to help in your monitoring system to identify these bugs so you can help to identify a nutrient based issue with the plant and then you can help to identify an insect based issue with the damage and nine times out of ten the diseased base issue is connected to the insect issue because the vast majority of the time the insect is a carrier of the disease that infects the plant. Like for example, the tomato spotted rip the tomato spotted wilt virus is caused by the thripped insect. However, that may not be as big of an issue because you took the preventions process forward. You have good strong soil, good strong nutrients, and crop rotation of helping to break that disease, that insect cycle in years past in order to make your tomatoes much stronger so what little impact that threat may cause for it is going to be null and void because you took the monitoring and prevention steps necessary to control that issue. Some of the items that we've talked about, whether it is the sticky traps, whether you're talking about the neem oil, identification markers, it is a huge help having these items on hand. And not everyone is as lucky as I am to have a brick and mortar store within driving distance, whether it's a specialty hydroponic store or a farm and ranch store that carries these products. Some of these items are going to be specialty items that are going to be harder to locate. And unless you have a specialized brick and mortar store that makes it easy, the only source that many people have ability to purchase these items is going to be online. To make it just that bit easier for you, I provided a few links below in the description where you can find some of these items. Keep in mind, 
I do not have any personal affiliation with any of these items that you may purchase. However, by me creating the links, by me recommending them, I will be getting a small percentage commission based off of that. Now, just because I get that commission, you'll be spending the exact same amount of money that you would have had you gone to Google and look those items up yourself. However, it does allow to provide a small amount of financial donation to the channel without you actually spending money to the channel to provide that. It's the same amount of money that you would have spent anyway, but it helps to give back a little bit to the channel so that way we can continue to do what we do. And if you do choose to use those links of what you would have purchased anyway, I just want to give you a sincere thanks and thank you so much in that own little way that you do in helping to support the channel. Now we're going to be going to our question of the day from Adam. Adam asks, I have a large amount of strawberries, but I never seem to be able to pick as many as I was like because birds and other insects eat them long before I'm able to ever get out to protect them. What can I do to help prevent insects, slugs, snails, and birds from eating my strawberries? Any help that you give me would be great. Well, Adam, strawberries are one of by far the best fruits that I absolutely love. They are delicious, sweet, and an important part of every breakfast that I absolutely love seasonally when they're available. I will grow so many of them, I'll freeze them, that way I can enjoy them year round. Now, strawberries are not only loved by humans, but they're also loved by birds, they're loved by insects, they're loved by slugs and snails. So what are a few methods that we can do to help protect our strawberries from these different little critters? First and foremost, birds are by far the easiest to protect against. What you can do is there's a couple different methods. You can do what's called flashers. You can hang a shiny piece of metal, maybe some ribbon or some sort of a flashy device to scare the birds away. Or if you want to spend a little bit more money, then you can get physical barriers like bird netting, drape it over a small little cage, a small little tunnel system, covering your strawberries so that way the birds can't physically gain access to do that. If you're going to do this method when you're dealing with bird netting, you want to make certain to elevate the netting up above the strawberries. It's not going to do you any good if you just take the netting and lay it on the ground on the floor of the strawberries. The birds are going to be able to land on the netting and pick straight through the bird netting to eat some of the strawberries. So you're going to want to find some way to elevate that netting up above. When you're dealing with insects, whether you're dealing with grasshoppers, caterpillars, or something else, you can do a couple different methods. You can use beneficial insects, predatory insects, whether they are ladybugs, praying mantis, or whatever else you're dealing with as it is pertinent to whatever bug is eating your strawberries. Another thing you can do is using low toxic forms of sprays. One that I really love is called Captain, Captain Jack's in regards to caterpillars. It uses sp spinosad oil that will help to get inside the internal gut and it does not make for a very fun day for the caterpillars. Another thing that you can use is neem oil or even insecticidal soaps are great, really good, low toxic options to help protect your strawberries from these buggy boys. When dealing with slugs and snails, that is a little bit harder because you're going to have to sacrifice some beer. Slugs and snails are very attracted to alcohol fermenting. What you can do is take a small little dish, fill it up with some beer, whatever is your least favorite brand, so that way you're not wasting the good stuff. So take your beer, put it in a small dish. The scent of the fermenting ethanol will attract slugs and snails into that dish of beer. The smell is good for them, but the beer itself is actually toxic to them and it's going to act as an acid and kill them, unfortunately. They will drown inside that. But that is a really great toxic, low toxic method of how to take care of slugs and snail is give them a drink of beer. Good for your friends, not so good for the snails and slugs.
Hope some of those tips help, Adam, and we look forward to hopefully you can enjoy strawberries this season. Now let's take a look at how do we want to take intervention to solve the issue. And the levels of intervention range from not doing anything at all to completely wiping out the entire system and starting from scratch. So let's go ahead and use the tomato spotted wilt virus and the example of thrips as a key example. You got your sticky monitoring traps and you're taking a look and you only have one, two thrips per square inch on that whole piece of paper and there is hardly anything at all. You can take a look at that and go, you know what? I've only got one or two thrips on my sticky strap and so therefore I really don't have that big of a problem. I don't need to apply anything. I don't need to do anything. One of the key things about integrated pest management is not only knowing when to take care of the problem, but when not to take care of the problem. If you only have a very minor, minor issue in the garden, by far the best thing you can do is nothing. Let nature handle itself. By having nature handle itself and not doing anything and having patience and not doing anything, that's going to save you time. So that way you're not spending time in the garden spraying thing that you may not need to. It's going to save you money because you're not having to spend money on chemicals, other issues that help to control the problem. And it's going to save you long term peace of mind because you're helping to build a good strong balance of in the future keeping things intact. Every time if you saw a small little thrip bug, you could take the example of the 1920s and 1930s and spray DEET and completely coat your entire field of stuff, wiping out everything, making it a barren nuclear wasteland for buggy boys. Congratulations, you have no bugs. But guess what? You also just wiped out all of the beneficial insects that would have helped to control the thrips. By far, one of the most common bugs that you're going to find are ladybugs. Ladybugs are a really, really great carnivore in the bug world. They will eat aphids. They will eat thrips. They are a great control factor of controlling a lot of these issue bugs. You have parasitic wasps. You have a lot of other beneficial insects that eat the bad insects to help control the problem. By doing nothing, you're allowing nature and the course of evolution of predator and prey fight it out. The only difference is, is it's done on a microscopic insect level rather than a much larger level that we're used to when you have the lion and the zebra kind of scenario. There is an entire ecosystem on a microscopic level of predator and prey that's being battled out by insects. By allowing the battle of the insects, a predator and prey, to fight it out, that's going to be long term much more beneficial for you. So knowing when to do something and when not to do something can be just as important as when it's needing to act to do something. So we've taken a look at the insects and it's a slightly bigger problem than we've decided we need to do. And so what we're going to do is we need to find a way to help control the issue. What we're going to do is we're going to do what we can to introduce beneficial insects to help control the issue. What we can do is we can add, what we can do is we can add ladybugs. We can add praying mantis. There's other carnivore type insects that control these other insects to encourage the development of that ecosystem. So that way we can control it. So that helps to be the good part of it. The bad part of it is if there's not enough large, if there is not a large enough prey population in the area for the predatory insects to feed off of, they will most likely go to another location, go find other buggy boys. So if it costs you eight, 10, $15 to buy a thing of ladybugs and you release them in your area, but there's not a large enough food source, they're just gonna go fly off somewhere else. 
So you're looking at beneficial insects and you decide that beneficial insects is not the way you want to go. And it, you really, really don't want to do chemicals. Well, there are other ways, cultural practices that you can do in the development of doing this without having to resort to pesticides using chemicals. You can use cultural practices. Now, what does this entail aside from allowing natural nature of predator and prey? You can use physical barriers to allow you to control the population. First thing you can do is hand picking off pests and insects. This only really this method really only works if you have larger bugs. You're dealing with caterpillars, you're dealing with grasshoppers, you're dealing with bigger boys that are going to cause more damage. But it's still a very effective method. You get you see a slug, you see a snail, go ahead, pick those guys off of them and dispose of them. You can use physical barriers to help control them. You're going to have really fine nesh bedding that you can drape over your plant. There's a lot of screen material. There is a lot of shade cloth type material that you can drape over the plant, causing that physical barrier to prevent the insect from being able to get to the plant to eat it. Some of your really, really fine microscopic insects may not be able to work, but for some of your medium, large size insects, some of your I mean, look at how small a mosquito is. There's still mosquito netting that prevents it from you being able to eat them. The exact same thing can be done with plants. There's nice fancy barriers that you can, tents that you can put over it. Or if you do want to do it on the cheap, go buy yourself some netting material, get yourself some PVC pipe, make yourself a little cage and drape that netting over it to help develop a cage to go over it. The larger your base group is of plants that you're trying to protect, the more expensive it gets. So that is one thing to keep in mind. But even if you're dealing with fruit trees, if you're dealing with birds and larger predators of your fruits and veggies, I can't tell you how many strawberries I've lost because birds come and eat them. I can't tell you how many cherries I've lost over the years because birds want to come and eat them. Get yourself some netting, drape it over the entire tree, build yourself a small little tunner and drape it over your strawberries. That physical barrier will do loads to not only help prevent against insects, but also birds, deer. Most of our discussions have been talking about insect pests, but there are other pests. There's birds, there's deer, there's rabbits. Anything that goes and eats your fruits and veggies that doesn't allow you to eat it could be considered a pest. So there are physical barriers that you could do. And now we're moving on to chemical barriers to help manage your infestations. There are many different levels of chemical means that we can use to help control it. There are organic methods. There are also synthetic methods to help control it. One of the great things that I love about modern technology is there has become development to help control these items. What are we looking at? You're gonna be looking at the organic end, the low end. There's gonna be oregano oil. There's going to be basil oil. Some of these things that have natural encouragements for buggy boys and scents to stay away you're going to be looking at a insecticidal soap. Insecticidal soaps are a really great organic way of helping to control a lot of these thrips, piercing insects, aphids to control it. What it does is it covers your entire plant with an oil dawn soap based material across mm -hmm. your plant. The bug will try and pierce into the plant. However, it's not able to get through the oil based material and it ends up dying. A lot of these organic based low methods are really, really great and they're going to be non-toxic. However, the number one downside to a lot of these items is they are very, very short lived. That what makes them great is they're short lived. So they're not going to be long term on your fruits and vegetables, but they're also going to be short term. So you have to apply them very frequently. For example, insecticidal soaps, it's only going to last 
about a week. So you're going to have to reapply it every single week in order to maintain your protection. Another really great organic oil that used to be organic from the plant itself extracted, many ways it still is, but we now in modern days have a synthetic substitute that mimics neem oil as well. So neem oil was found off of the neem plant in the tropics where they have a large amount of insects and so naturally it developed a natural barrier in the plant itself through evolution and that's called neem oil. Another really great example of that is tobacco. Nicotine inside the plant of tobacco has been found to be a natural insecticide. So whether you're in North America, South America, or other parts of the world, there are these plants that have naturally developed through evolution defense mechanisms against plants. Nicotine and neem oil are two really great examples of this. By using neem oil is a really great example of how you can go to try and protect your plants using an organic insecticide to protect it. When you're talking about diseases, you can use a copper-based fungicide. Copper-based fungicide is a really great organic way of helping to control a lot of your powdery mildews, a lot of your fungicides that can plague a lot of these plants due to high moisture environments. There are organic methods of how you can solve this problem that's going to be much less toxic. Now, a lot of these low toxicity options are really, really great and a key implementation of how to take care of interventions. And knowing when to apply them, whether it's on the low end of not doing anything or on the high end of taking care of that, utmost importance is education, education, education. If you don't know what you don't know, then you're not going to know how to solve the problem. The final aspect of intervention leads back in a loop back into the three core pillars. You're looking at prevention, monitoring, intervention. All three pillars of integrated pest management all have one key factor included, education. There's constantly new synthetic as well as natural based products that are going to be much healthier for the environment. They're going to be much better for your soil health. They're going to be much better for the microbial organisms in the soil. They're going to be much better overall for the environment. Point and key, by far the best recently developed is sticky traps. Those are an absolute benefit to help monitor what's going on. The use of education and knowing those exist allow us in that monitoring early detection allows us to help know what type of method we need to use in our intervention process to control that issue. By having and continually gaining education about the three pillars, not only in cultural practices, techniques, or potentially new products that come out to help us out with the battle of integrated pest management will allow us to prevent us from creating mistakes that we have made like the Mississippi Delta that we're now trying to deal with to correct the problem. It's much easier to prevent the problem than have the problem and trying to correct it taking a hundred years down the road in our future generations. Thank you so much for joining us today as we talk about the three core pillars of integrated pest management of how we can more sustainably work on our gardening practices through that method of integrated pest management. If you're gaining value from this information, if you like what we're doing with, please, we'd like to encourage you to share this information, this podcast with your friends, family. Not only does it help us out with the YouTube algorithm, but it helps us for our channel to grow so we can much more help to reach other people to encourage good gardening practices to better help us grow in tune with nature, taking examples from nature implementing them with our own lives with modern technology. If you're watching this via YouTube, please consider subscribing, helping us out with that. It would really benefit us out with the algorithm. Thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next time where we're going to be talking about the key three tenets of nutrients 
of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, not only how to add them to your soil, but also what they do for your plant to help encourage a much healthier plant overall as we take this journey for more healthy living with plants, integrated pest management, and the integration with nature. Thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next time.